Um, it's, it's very easy to say something should be reserved um, as experimental and done research, more research upon it. it it's, um, and I see it a lot. So I see patients who have been offered surgery or radiotherapy and come to me wanting to preserve genitourinary function and they tell me that their um, advisors have told them that the intervention is experimental. And then I say, you know, which bit of it is experimental? And we can make errors in, in, in both directions. So this is a bi-directional issue. Uh, you can introduce technology or modern healthcare interventions too early or too late. The overwhelming evidence at the moment is that we're probably introducing many too late. And the big story is in clot-busting drugs. And if you go back and look at the evidence that was accumulating over the years and the many systematic reviews that show that you could save not just thousands but hundreds of thousands of lives and, and really big morbidities uh, was there a long time before it was introduced because everybody said, we want more data. And that's what researchers tend to say because they are the people that generate data. And it, is, it has been worked out that um, something in the order of 200,000 lives could have been saved had clot-busting drugs been introduced at the right time. And so, so it's not an easy thing to judge, um, this question, but we can make errors in both directions, and that's often not um, appreciated. This is the man in question. He will be familiar uh, to most of you. Um, he's been offered surgery. He's been offered radiotherapy for the lesion in the right peripheral zone of the prostate. He's been very well staged um, in, in the way that we discussed yesterday, and that lesion in the right side of the prostate uh, was interrogated in the modern manner, and it generated a very specific risk stratification. He's clinically T1C. You can't feel that lesion, but you can certainly see it. And you can see that he's got Gleason 3 plus 4. Pattern 4 uh, amounts to 20% of the overall tissue that was um, harvested, giving you a very accurate risk of the quantification of Gleason pattern 4. Three of the four targeted were positive. Uh, 3, 5, and 8 millimeters maximum cancer core length, depending on which bit of the tumor was hit. So that's the... That's the information we have on this individual. And the question is, is today, is it reasonable for him to have that lesion treated plus a margin um, outside of a clinical trial? Now remember, if you insist on a, on a clinical trial, uh, you are rationing care. Trials occur only in certain hospitals and only in certain countries, and you will slow down the diffusion and dissemination of a technology. So it's a very responsible decision that you have to make. And I suppose the question is, is the evidence in terms of safety, early efficacy, uh, patient desirability, utility um, sufficient to allow us to treat this in a high quality center by people who know what they're doing uh, in today's world? Um, and we are looking at it, and it's almost impossible to recruit men to a trial uh, in which men are randomly allocated to surgery or a focal therapy approach because of the difference uh, in the outcomes, mainly in terms of genitourinary function. You can do it if the only way to get focal treatment is through the study. So if you ration focal therapy to a trial, you can force men to risk a 50% allocation in the hope that they would get focal therapy. Uh, we've been unable to recruit because we've got an established centre in centres in other centres in England where the only way to get focal therapy is through this. They can recruit, albeit slowly, and this trial has required an extension. And there are many panellists here in the room that know what it's like to recruit slowly to a trial. It's very, very frustrating, and it tells us something about the values and preferences of the patients who are being considered. Um, Freddie said there's something for everybody. Well, yes, there's something, I think, here for focal therapy. Um, this is what men want to avoid, um, the kind of near 50% occurrence of sexual dysfunction when allocated to surgery versus the active surveillance approach here, and the nearly 20% risk of incontinence. People have criticized this, saying this is UK data done in uh, district hospitals. These are exactly the same data as Sloan Kettering have reported in their Andrew Vickers study. So it's, it's that delta between these two things that men want to avoid. And going back to Noel's point earlier, um, it isn't necessary failure. At the beginning of the discussion, we have a discussion about active surveillance, which is a strategy to keep your prostate. That discussion might transition to a discussion about partial treatment of that prostate so that they can keep their genital unifunction. function. And the discussion does involve um, talk about what would happen if that strategy failed. And, and it's not failure, it's just merely transition to another form of care. As a woman who has a lumpectomy, 
uh, will know that if she has local recurrence, there might be a requirement to go to mastectomy. And so the way in which the discussion is couched is critically important. There is freedom to operate. I think PROTECT gives us enormous amount of freedom to operate in that there was very, very little harms attributed um, in terms of overall and disease-specific survival um, based on the allocation of therapy. If you've got a single um, arm study in which the patients are going to get focal therapy, even though it's extremely experimental, patients fight to get on it. And these were the three studies that we did originally. That was the very first one, quite hard to recruit to because we're quite exacting in terms of the pathology. We relaxed the entry criteria, recruited really, really quickly in, I think, about 10 months uh, to this study. And I suppose these are the future residual questions that arise about adjuvant therapy and about the way in which we manage, need to manage the out-of-field areas uh, of the prostate. And these could be randomized studies. So in other words, randomizing men to finasteride, dutasteride, to 40 gray maybe, or to a well-tolerated immunotherapy. And this will allow more men to have this type of treatment and maintain their function for longer. Some men will need to transition to other care, some men will not. We have proven without question that tissue preservation matters, as it does in the kidney. Uh, if you keep hold of your prostate, you keep hold of your continence, and you keep hold of your erectile and, increasingly, ejaculatory function. Uh, this has been reviewed in a recent survey um, done independently by a group of andrologists that we handed over our data, showing there's no statistical difference between focal men receiving focal therapy between baseline and the 12-month uh, year assessment, 12 -month assessment. Apologies. Now, is it safe? We haven't got much time, so I'm just going to... This is a, a trial that was presented at the EAU. Um, it's not quite in press. Hopefully, I'll be able to say that it's in press quite soon. Um, this is a trial showing that focal therapy in a phase three study can hit its endpoints, its pre-stated endpoints, in terms of progression compared to active surveillance um, and, indeed, in terms of requirement for um, definitive um, uh, uh, radical surgery. But that's not the important bit. The important bit is against active surveillance. Remember the delta between surgery uh, versus active surveillance in the um, PROTECT study. There is no difference here. You can treat half a prostate uh, in 42 centers with lots of learning curves and all the vagaries of treating men in, in the modern world. This isn't expert centers. And you can achieve this extraordinary level of toxicity in level one phase three data. Moreover, in 42 centers who've never done this treatment before, it is extraordinarily safe. Um, there was a slight increase in temporary genitourinary toxicity related probably to putting needles through the perineum, but really importantly, you know, against active surveillance, this is a tough comparator to make, no difference in, in severe um, uh, toxicity relating to the treatment. So we've got phase three evidence. And do we want another phase three study? Do we want two more phase three studies? You know, is this sufficient in terms of safety and early, early efficacy to say that, it's re that in a responsible healthcare setting with people who know what they're doing, it's reasonable to offer the man that we saw at the beginning of the presentation um, a, a selective treatment to the right-hand side of the prostate and monitor him very carefully. He can keep his prostate as long as he doesn't progress either within field or indeed out of field. This is desirable to patients. It preserves baseline status. It's safe. These are all the knowns. It's effective in the short to medium term. We now know about the within field status. If you don't recur within field within two years, exactly the same as breast cancer, you're going to be safe within field. And then the surveillance um, task is much more relaxed because then you have a much lower rate of progression out of field. It's exactly the same as breast cancer, and we are learning about the salvage opportunity, and we now know that radiotherapy after focal therapy is exceedingly well tolerated. What do we not know? What are the residual questions? Out of field status, the biology, I think we need to learn a lot more about the biology of the lesions that we're choosing not to treat. Uh, we also need to know a lot more about the kind of long-term results of sequential therapies, uh, which again are, are beginning to accumulate and giving us an opportunity to look at them. But those are going to be done much better through registries. We'll get much quicker accrual than through any type of um, uh, interventional study. Any study, any interventional study that we propose is going to be big, expensive, and probably won't deliver for 15 to 20 years. And we'll have to consider, A, whether it will ever, ever be done, and B, whether anybody will fund it. So I think in the modern world, uh, and this goes back to comments made earlier, um, these aren't in competition. This is a spectrum of care that we deliver to men who've been well categorized 
Uh, so in other words, they're, they're diagnost the diagnostic precision that we now have is extremely good. Some will have surveillance, some won't even be diagnosed, some will require uh, multimodality therapy. But in the middle, uh, we now have a treatment that we can administer safely with early efficacy that will maintain function uh, in many men uh, for quite a long time. And I think it's the complementary nature of this uh, that we need. So the pathway's changed. Um, the pathway's changed. Thank you very much. <laughs> So this is the question. Focal therapy for men with intermediate risk prostate cancer in a solitary lesion should be the standard of care. Now, um, Mark and I, the slides just won't go there. Mark and I are old friends. Um, and he's a very plausible character. Uh, but this is a debate. <laughs> and uh, things can get dirty. So let's think about it this way. Faith, belief, and evangelism in medicine. And Mark is an expert. He's published widely on this. 62 articles on focal therapy in 10 years. 39 in the last three years. This is a straight PubMed when you put in MMBTN focal therapy. This is what you get. And these are other articles that are on the side. New treatment of prostate cancer gives perfect results. Fantastic. No wonder you can recruit to a trial at UCL. Everybody wants it when they read the Daily Telegraph. But what I think people should read is this. This is a paper on natural selection of bad science, and I would commend it to you all. This is a 60-year analysis of the studies um, in behavioral scientists, and they apply to studies which we're doing in cancer. And what it looks at over that time is the power of studies. And what it showed is that in 60 years, the power of the study is still very poor. Too many studies, too small. But what it also goes on to show is this very interesting um, uh, projection, which is that if you look at the number of publications and the number of bad publications in this lot, this is co commensurate with career advancement. So the more you publish, the more money you get, the better your kudos, the better your chance of survival. And the ones who do this are the ones who don't publish very much, but necessarily publish better papers because they don't publish poor science. So perhaps we should follow uh, the diktat of this paper. An incentive structure that rewards publication quantity will, in the absence of countervailing forces, select for methods that produce the greatest number of publishable results. Well, 39 in three years, not bad going. This in turn will lead to the natural selection of poor methods and increasingly high false discovery rates. Now, faith, belief, and evangelism is what I think we have at the moment. So if something's repeated it often enough, people start to believe it's true. Now, take this as an example. We've heard about clot-busting drugs, how many lives it saved. This is a publication in 1962, Achieving Physiological Gastrectomy by Gastric Freezing. And this, these are the studies that were published, 1962 through 65 to 68, until the randomized trial was reported in 1969 and it showed it was no good. 18,000 patients treated before the therapy was proven to be ineffective. 18,000. How much did that cost? Well, let's look at some facts. We've had all this over the last uh, 24 hours. We know that surveillance is a very good option for low and certain intermediate risk disease. What we know from PROTECT is what we've seen, that actually this kind of disease doesn't need treating if it's surveyed and the outcomes are very good. Let's look at some of the, of the other statements which are made in the many publications. Treat the dominant lesion. Well, what is the dominant lesion? I mentioned this yesterday in my talk. Martin mentioned it again. We know that it's multifocal. We know that there are chromosomal alterations in the metastases that don't correspond in any way to the primary. These are two good examples of this from 95, 97. And this is up to date. What we know from this sophisticated paper is that the dominant lesion doesn't really exist. It's a pathological entity, but it has no bearing in the biology of what's going on. And we know that when the dominant lesion is sometimes um, recorded, it's not responsible for the metastatic lesion. 
So if we're working on the premise with focal therapy, treat the dominant lesion, well, why are we doing that in multi multifocal disease when we know that in many cases the dominant lesion is not responsible for metastasis? And we know also from this paper which I showed you yesterday from Toronto and other centers that the tumor is multifocal, that the genetic rearrangements are very different in each of these individual tumors. <coughs> and if we treat one tumor, well, what about the rest of them? We have genomic instability, which I've already talked about, uh, even in low-risk cancers, biologically Gleason 6, and we know that some of those patients will fail. Are these the right patients for focal therapy? Are we treating the right area? Well, I'm really not sure. In the earlier session, I talked about clinical staging. And again, most patients would have clinical staging, even with sophisticated MR imaging. We know that about a third of those are T3 from the PROTECT study and other studies which have reported. We also uh, know that we can improve this with MR scanning. Absolutely great. A big advance. We're all doing it. It still misses one in 10 of the uh, significant cancers which we know will progress. So the clinical staging is not there. Uh, we haven't yet uh, uh, got our MR imaging sufficiently accurate that we're not going to miss cancers, and we're missing small volume, high-grade cancers with state-of-the-art imaging. Let's look at the data on the effectiveness of HIFU as a, a treatment in large scale. There's only one large-scale study that I'm aware of, and that's the Leon group, who have been very honest in publishing uh, on over 1,000 patients treated with whole gland high food for low, intermediate, and high-risk disease. And what you can see is that when you're missing high-risk disease, the outcome is not great. Um, and although we hear about side effect profile, what we can see from this paper in everyday practice in a very good unit in Lyon, stress incontinence was high, acute urinary retention was high, there were stenotic uh, areas uh, in the urethra, running at about 6% on large scale. This is not on 47 patients published in The Lancet, which is effectively a phase one study. This is on a large scale, real world study. It is a toxic treatment. And then we go on to this other question. What happens with failure to control the index lesion when we've ablated it? What happens to these lesions? And we've already seen an example earlier this morning of a failed focal therapy uh, case with Anwar Padani's uh, presentation earlier on. Well, we know that some of these patients will fail, and I've already showed you this data. What happens when you then go on to treat these with radical prostatectomy? The fibrosis is bad, you can't nerve spare, and the complication rates are high, ureteric reimplantation, transfusion, stenosis. Incontinence is much higher than we would expect for a normal prostatectomy, erectile dysfunction of the order of 95%, numerous positive margins. And this is in a group of patients that we probably didn't need to treat in the first place, that we just needed to watch and identify those who were going to progress. And when they progressed, we could treat them either with radiotherapy or surgery with a better expectation of, of outcome than we see here in the salvage setting. So I put it to you, Mark, that we need to read a little bit more about the selection, do our studies well, assume nothing in medicine, do the study, and then we'll believe it. Thank you. <laughs>